I'm going to talk about uh, the convergence a, a bit uh, between simulation, uh, data analysis, and uh, machine learning, and uh, sort of how it might be pushing us in computer architecture a bit. So if I was giving this talk five, six years ago, I would talk about this slide. And uh, in this slide, there's two examples, one from cosmology and one from material science, that shows on the left, um, theory and computing pushing towards uh, some problem solving uh, in the middle that's joined from the right by large scale data analysis or collection. So in the first case, it's of course uh, Einstein's theory with big supercomputers allowing you to simulate mock galaxies or synthetic skies and comparing that data to observational data that you might get from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and statistics you might pull from that. On the second example, it's uh, material science uh, where you might have a, uh, a theoretical or computational model of some material. You're going to simulate the structure. You're going to simulate, say, x-ray scattering. You're going to generate some kind of uh, diagram, phase diagram, maybe in this case properties versus dopant or something. And on the right-hand side, you're going to have actual samples that you put in something like the advanced photon source, collect scattering data, and validate uh, your model. Okay, so this was what I would talk about five years ago. But something's happened in the last five years that's starting to change the landscape. This is a plot from Google, from the internal software repositories in Google over. Uh, four or five years, and it showed that in 2002, or 2012, sorry, there was a, you know, maybe a hundred or so projects on machine learning, and by 2015, there was nearly 3,000, and now there's something like 5,000 projects. So what's happened in the last five years is that there's been an enormous amount of progress in the capability to apply machine learning to all kinds of problems, and that's disrupting uh, our, our normal way of thinking in high performance computing. So if you look at the market analysis statistics, um, the current thinking is that by 2020, the machine learning market might reach uh, $40 billion. I'll show you some more slides on that. The deep learning component of that that's really dependent upon large scale uh, numerical uh, methods, you know, matrix uh, vector operations and so on, is going to be maybe 5 billion by 2020. And this turns out to be uh, sufficiently, uh, uh, growing sufficiently quickly or aggressively, if you want to use that term, that it's capturing the attention of the primary vendors. So NVIDIA is the uh, uh, developer or the hardware manufacturer that's probably the most impacting deep learning right now with, with GPUs. Um, and this was from a couple of months ago when they announced the V100, which is really uh, a part aimed squarely at the AI market uh, and only kind of secondarily at the HPC market, even though it's their primary product. And of course, Intel uh, is not going to be left behind. Intel is busy working on half a dozen strategies for competing with NVIDIA in the deep learning market and trying to figure out both how to optimize existing uh, x86 architectures for the inferencing component of machine learning so that it, it would be a partner to the codes that are developed uh, with GPUs. If you look at who's hiring, um, these are some recent pictures from Monster. Um, and uh, if you look at Amazon, uh, some combination of AI, machine learning, and deep learning is they've got something like 2,000 open positions. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, everybody is hiring in machine learning. It's uh, clearly we can't produce uh, well trained people fast enough. And if you look at the scale of the market, um, this is a, a ser there's a whole bunch of these analysis. I'm not going to go into them, but uh, you can just kind of get your sense of the exponential. That by 2025, maybe $60 billion. There was a recent analysis that tried to collapse the growth rates down a little bit. So, in this example here, you know, simulation, what we all think of as traditional high performance computing, uh, even if you kind of squint a little bit on the scale of machines, so you kind of consider 
simulation writ large is maybe a $30 billion market. By the way, it's a lot smaller than disposable diapers um, and a lot smaller than potato chips, um, just to put it in perspective. Um, but it's only growing at about 5% per year. Okay? The data analysis market is quite a bit bigger, you know, uh, growing maybe at 11% uh, per year. But the deep learning market is a lot smaller, but growing at this kind of incredible 65% per year. Now, it's not clear these growth rates will continue, but if they did, right, deep learning would be bigger than high performance computing by 2025, 2024, 25, right? And deep learning would be bigger than data analysis by 2030. So something is going on, right? This is this trend, this, this push, isn't just uh, occasional articles about uh, self-driving cars. It's kind of permeating uh, everything that's going on. Now, a few years ago, we started taking a look at, well, how much is machine learning and deep learning in particular, but really machine learning in the broadest sense, impacting science? And I started. Uh, looking across the literature, and prior to about 2010, you would only get kind of occasional oddball publications. Now, I, mean, I started out working in this area you know, 30 years ago, um, and we had this vision that we were going to figure out how intelligence works, and then we were going to apply it to all the cool problems in science, and we'd be you know, traveling at warp speed by now. And of course, that didn't, didn't happen. Um, but um, it's clear that. Uh, machine learning and AI is starting to impact science. And I'll just quickly walk you through a handful of examples here. So in climate, um, there's, of course, traditional simulation applied to modeling the atmosphere, modeling ocean, coupled climate models. Um, and they're starting to become uh, a, a large scale use of machine learning in analyzing climate simulation output, and also in, of course, remote sensing data. Uh, it started out doing things like statistical downsampling or downscaling, where you get a uh, forecast. I mean, you all have probably seen, you know, weather.com type forecasts or now casting coming out of the commercial weather sector. Um, that comes from relatively high resolution meteorological models, but with a ton of statistical data that show correlations between the uh, local conditions at various places and, and other places within a forecast region. And it's the statistical correlation that actually gives it really kind of uncanny accuracy. But we're also starting to see machine learning affect subgrid scale physics, um, estimate of climate statistics more generally without a physical model, um, choosing the best uh, representatives out of ensemble simulations, and so forth. Um, one that's particularly interesting when I was doing these searches a few years ago was this search for what they call dipoles. So these are uh, locations on the planet that have uh, especially statistical uh, correlations or anti-correlations in the patterns. And, and, a, and a, a good example of this is like the El Nino, El Nino effect. But it turns out there's quite a few of them. And uh, people have been starting to mine this data with machine learning to find examples uh, that we haven't known before, and that's starting to occur. We're seeing deep learning apply in genomics. Uh, this particular example here is trying to predict uh, binding sites uh, for proteins to do transcriptional regulation. Um, we're trying to use it to predict, uh, say, the behavior or the lifestyle of a bacteria just from its genome without actually looking at any of the genes. That's starting to show promise. Um, we can use it to classify tumors. Uh, my group's also using it to predict drug response, uh, to predict outcomes in cancer. Uh, a really uh, aggressive activity is starting to happen in pharma. So most of the major pharmaceutical companies have started tinkering with machine learning as a complement to traditional simulation methods for drug screening. Um, and if you look at the accuracies of traditional methods compared to uh, machine learning and, and deep learning methods, the deep learning methods are, are winning. Um, and they're starting to beat simulations at structure activity relationship prediction. Uh, and that's leading to a large number of companies. Um, there's a list from uh, a Nature Biotech paper from a couple days ago uh, that uh, you can see the company. There's a half a dozen of them here each of them trying to apply some kind of uh, machine learning or deep learning to the problem of drug design. In some cases, it's malaria or metabolic disease or oncology. 
These are startups, uh, mostly have been around for less than a year or so. Um, people have been applying this technology to uh, the social media, in particular Twitter feeds, uh, to try to predict where uh, flu will, will break out. Um, so you can search Twitter for you know phrases like, I feel crappy, or I'm not going to work today, or I just threw up, or whatever, and you can start building statistical models from that text, and it's pretty good at predicting uh, where people are gonna go to the doctor in the next couple of days, so it's like an early warning system for flu. And we can even uh, make some progress on coupling climate modeling with our understanding of the relationship between um, uh, climate uh, statistics, weather statistics, disease, insect populations, and so on to predict risk for certain kinds of uh, diseases, say, in Africa for global infectious disease. And this would allow you to, say, deploy uh, resources uh, in a very focused way to reduce the disease burden. In material science, we're seeing it for predicting all kinds of properties of materials. Uh, it's kind of like the materials genome, except instead of using simulation as the primary basis for making the predictions, it's simulation, doing a lot of simulation, building training sets, then training, in this case, deep neural networks to predict the properties, and then opening up the, the screen to millions or potentially billions of combinations by having the high level screening done from the neural network. In cosmology, um, there are groups that are using it to uh, search through image data, uh, both from simulation and from observation to look for things like uh, gravitational lensing events, and these are, or observations, and these are key for using large scale cosmological data to measure things like the expansion of the universe or estimating dark matter and dark energy uh, constraints. Um, and an example, you might actually, I don't know, if, is Salman gonna talk in any of these over the next couple of weeks? Do you know Salman Habib? No, okay, so I'll say a few words about what he's doing. So, so they are, uh, uh, it, was, it was the first line in that first slide that I used about simulating the sky and uh, in their initial data sets, they were using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as the observational database. How many of you have heard of Mechanical Turk, the Amazon service, okay? So the Mechanical Turk is basically a service where you can pay uh, very small amounts of money, you know, a few cents, uh, for somebody to do a simple task. Usually it's a classification task of some form. So, and a lot, a lot of these uh, participants in Mechanical Turk are in uh, developing countries uh, where they have internet, but you know, not, not a lot of other infrastructure. Uh, so what they did is they took uh, image uh, uh, patches out of the Sloan Sky Survey and they identified manually uh, some number, a few hundred of these uh, gravitational lensing examples and then they turned the data loose to the population and housewives and you know, random people were classifying this stuff and, and finding interesting new uh, galaxy shapes and so on. But as they move forward to something like um, the uh, Large Synoptic Sky Survey Telescope, the data rate will simply be too high to use humans to do this. And so the only way to keep up, you have to keep up with about 15 terabytes a night uh, coming off these instruments, is to train something like a convolutional neural network on the best data that we have from observation and simulation and then use it to screen these things and only present the hits to the user. So what we're starting to see is that there's lots of areas in science where this coupling maybe of simulation or large scale data with machine learning is starting to have an impact. And um, a few years ago we started asking the question, well what does this mean from our large scale facilities? What should we be doing to actually be aligned with where things seem to be going naturally. And so um, we asked ourselves this kind of question. So we did some back of the envelope calculations and said, well, you know, we don't really have any good data for this, but maybe by 2021, something like a third of the jobs on the machine might actually be doing some kind of machine learning in addition to or instead of traditional simulation. And what should we 
consider from an architectural standpoint to support that, right? And uh, given that we're on this kind of path towards exascale, do we have a window of opportunity to kind of bring these things together? So that's mainly what I'm gonna talk about. So if we took a snapshot kind of today of the way in which we use big simulation platforms, data analysis, visualization, and maybe GPU clusters for learning, we'd see a picture of something like this. So we have simulations. Simulations tend to produce more data than they consume typically, not always, but mostly. Um, data analysis is uh, you know, taking data from simulations, from other things too, but it's, uh, you know, it's gonna produce pictures or statistics. We might be using learning right now to do some inferencing on that data. And of course, if we're trying to uh, create pictures, we might use machine learning for interpreting that or, or train the machine learning on it. But as we go forward, we think there's a bigger opportunity. And it really is in coupling, in a tight way, simulation with, uh, with machine learning. And I'm gonna try to walk you through at least two ways that we think we can do this and, and what this might mean architecturally. Okay. So the first connection is this idea of embedding simulation in deep learning training. Okay, so how many people have done some machine learning, some deep learning, or at least played with things like TensorFlow or PyTorch or something? Okay, so you'll have some notion of what I'm talking about. So um, one basic way to do this is usually we think about training a deep neural network with large volumes of data, that data typically is experimental data or observational data, sometimes it might be simulation data, but in kind of an offline fashion. So we might have a data set with thousands or tens of thousands of cancer data sets or chemical structures or something like that, um, and we try to learn, uh, in a supervised case, we try to learn some set of properties um, as a function of the features of that data that we're training on. But another way to think about this is to have two ways of training. One is using the data, and one is to use a simulation to provide hints on what ground truth is, okay? And this idea uh, fits into this notion that was already extant a few years ago called the teacher-student paradigm for deep learning. And the original concept was the teacher is viewed as this very big model, it's very detailed, I mean, in a deep learning sense, it, it has a high predictive power, right? And we're trying to learn, in this case, the student model, a cheaper, faster version of the teacher. Okay, it's an interesting philosophical view of teachers and students, okay? And in our case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to replace that teacher model with a simulation, and the simulation can provide hints to the student to correct the student's learning, okay? Uh, from models where we're actually simulating maybe from first principles as opposed to from data. And these simulations can be invoked many, many times during training and uh, often the training rate would be limited by simulation. And a good example of this is a problem we're working on in, in cancer. So we can learn models right now of drug response from data from real cell lines or mouse models or patients, right? Um, and these models are pretty uh, good at predicting things, but they're very bad at explaining things. And yet we might have uh, mechanistic models, pathway models or protein interaction models or drug protein interaction models that are actually very accurate in the small scale, but we don't know how to aggregate them up. And so one way of building a hybrid model is to treat the simulation as getting a certain subset of the data absolutely correct while we learn the rest of the relationship using traditional learning on the data. And the way that would work is something like this. So you have a teacher here, in this case it's looking at gene expression, and the student is learning something. The teacher is able to make uh, higher quality predictions, and the student essentially learns to bias its uh, output essentially by what's coming from the teacher. And in our case, we replace that teacher module that would be trained on say higher resolution data or better data from a model that's, that's trained with a simulation. And we have a project that's doing this uh, in the context of developing cancer drugs for, um, uh, d well, cases where the mutation is in kinases. I won't go into the details, but in this diagram here, 
we have simulations where we're trying to estimate binding properties of different kinases under different mutations to different drugs. And the blue lines are all places where we're using machine learning to learn the relationship. And the uh, green boxes here are where we're actually simulating uh, tighter, uh, air, you know, uh, tighter air bars, essentially, on the, uh, uh, on the binding affinities. Okay? So the second example is where we have a simulation, and we're going to replace part of that simulation with a machine learned function. Okay? So we might have a model, maybe I'll, I'll use an example, which is say a climate model. And uh, you know, climate, even the most high resolution climate model today has a grid on the order of maybe a kilometer. Okay? Um, and yet, uh, inside that grid cell, we might be modeling physical processes that have natural length scales of millimeters. You know, for example, cloud radiative physics, uh, maybe even smaller than that. And so, um, you know, the challenge is we have these very, very sub, uh, fine grain subgrid scale physics models, and yet we have to kind of interpolate them up to the scale of the grid and average them. And there's a lot of potential. Uh, wasted computation in doing this very fine grain physics uh, where we don't actually need it. Um, so if we can find some way to use machine learning to, to learn an estimate of that function, right, and we might be able or might be willing to trade accuracy for power or for performance um, or speed, right, um, and this now gives us a set of knobs that we wouldn't have uh, before. And uh, in this case, you're running a simulation, but it may be in thousands or millions of grid points, maybe synchronously or maybe asynchronously, you're going to invoke a machine learned model. Maybe you're not going to train it, but you're going to invoke it uh, to predict something. And how can we support that? Well, it turns out a few years ago, a group at Microsoft did some experiments like this. So I won't go through this in great detail, but on the left, are some benchmark problems, things like Black Shoals or some uh, uh, modeling of fluids or um, uh, options pricing and some other image processing things. And what they did is they went in and found a primary computational kernel. They wrapped code around that kernel to essentially output both the input arguments to that kernel and the computed function value. So they essentially produced a supervised learning data set from running this thing. Um, and then they came up with an artificial neural network approximation. Okay, and so this kind of is a schematic for what they did. And then they went in and replaced that kernel with the machine learned version of it and then ran it as part of a long term simulation to see uh, what was happening. And uh, I, again, we don't, because you're on a fast schedule here, on average they were getting something like, you know, two, two and a half times speed up. They were getting some power reduction, in this case, on average, about three times power reduction in exchange for about 7% error. Okay? Now, that may sound like a lot of error, but it depends on what you're trying to do, whether that's a reasonable trade-off. Okay? And this was only on a handful of examples you know, in one experiment. So we think that both of these directions are, are likely and becoming more common in the future in addition to large-scale use of deep learning for training you know, in and of itself. So um, about two years ago, well, not quite two years ago, um, DOE uh, started a joint project with the National Cancer Institute, and I'm one of the PIs of this. Uh, it spans multiple labs. It spans Argonne, Oak Ridge, Livermore, and Los Alamos, and includes the National Cancer Institute, the Frederick National Lab of Cancer. And one of the things that we are doing is trying to um, figure out um, what kind of large-scale computing simulations are needed for pushing forward on cancer research and what are the uh, requirements from cancer that might cause us to want to modify the properties of the hardware. And one kind of cartoon view of that is something like this. So the uh, left-hand red square here, uh, you can't quite see the circles, this projector, but um, there's three circles, they kind of intersect a bit, but traditional uh, HPC machines were kind of designed for that uh, sweet spot on large scale numerical simulation, right? Solving PDEs, maybe sparse or dense problems there. Um, but to solve uh, work in cancer, 
we've got to expand beyond that to being able to do data analysis, data analytics, and traditional kinds of things, as well as deep learning. And what does that mean going forward from a computer architecture standpoint? So if we look at um, the canonical node concept, this came out of a report from uh, Berkeley a couple years ago, um, Sandia, and this, there's, this is just kind of a super generalized cartoon, right? So we've got a node, a node has some uh, thin cores or special purpose accelerators, it has some fat cores, traditional kind of cores, you could think of that as GPUs or you know, regular host processors or something else. You might have some fast uh, 3D stacked memory uh, that's very high bandwidth but relatively modest capacity and maybe some non-volatile memory or something else that's uh, of maybe more capacity but maybe not quite as fast and a pile of uh, communication off of that node into some fabric and, um, and pretty much all the node design points at some level of abstraction could be mapped into that. Um, and so one of the things that we started thinking about was, okay, if we know there's gonna be these deep learning work workloads, and we know that there's potentially this idea of coupling simulation with learning, both in training and, and inference mode, uh, one possible way would be to stand up two separate systems, right? So we have a big cluster that's optimized for learning and a big cluster that's optimized for um, HPC, and that's one way to do it, maybe integrate it over a fabric. Um, but that would, uh, I mean, there's maybe advantages in doing that in that each system and each silo in some sense would be clean, right? The disadvantage might be that we'd have to do a lot of duplication in both systems. So uh, one argument for putting uh, all this stuff on the same node or architecturally in some integrated fashion is that um, you can leverage the resources that are on the node, right? All the things that I talked about before, um, rather than having to duplicate things. And then the question becomes, you know, if you look at this model here, are there accelerator types that are better or worse for the machine learning workloads? And I think this is the kind of question of the day. I mean, it's the billion dollar or many billion dollar question. And there's lots of possible strategies, right? You could come up with some kind of vector processor. Uh, we know we can use that. The SIMD engines that are on uh, the Knight series and in Intel, for example, are pretty good at doing this. Uh, we could dream up some data flow engines. We could have patches of FPGAs where we move deep learning acceleration into the FPGAs. We could have lots of nano cores. Maybe we could go neuromorphic. Maybe we could go with some kind of a neural net uh, convolutional specialized core. Know, tensor engines and so on, there's tons of things. In fact, if you go and start searching in the literature, you'll find that there's like, you know, 30 or 40 projects each trying to come up with a solution that I've been talking about, right? So if you're <coughs> Intel, uh, I mean, you have been extending your instruction set for a long time, and uh, over the next couple of years, Intel has a set of, uh, roll, will roll out uh, machine learning instructions, right? Special instructions for doing low precision inferencing, special instructions for doing vector, high, high width vector operations. You've got uh, variations on different GPUs, the high end generations. You've got AMD announcing something, it's almost shipping. Baidu even went out and built its own GPU just for machine learning so that if the US decided not to sell GPUs to China, they would still have something, right? Uh, we've got all kinds of application specific circuits. Intel bought Nirvana, which is building a uh, specialized accelerator just for deep learning. Uh, there's a, a series of design points out of China, the Nano systems that were designed not to just accelerate deep learning, but shallow learning. There's companies that you might not hear, hear much about yet, Iris, GraphCore in the UK. Google came up with the Tensor Processing Unit. Fujitsu's got their deep learning unit, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's trying to figure out what is the magic sauce here, right? And you can even do FPGAs uh, uh, in your nodes. And then there's companies, IBM, Qualcomm, Intel, working on neuromorphic hardware that tries to mimic more brain-like operations as a way to accelerate things. So as we start looking forward to the exascale system we're designing at Argonne, um, 
we came up with some kind of high-level principles that we wanted to do. So we, we've started calling this concept of balance between simulation and data and learning the three pillars. Um, there's nothing special about that name. I think, I think Susan came up with it or some, Susan Coughlin or something. But anyway, so we want to be able to support traditional large-scale simulations and not be a second-class platform for that. We want to be able to support data-intensive uh, applications, particularly those that are pipeline oriented. And, and this is a little bit different twist on this. So um, often when people talk about data analytics, they're thinking Spark or Hadoop workflows. And while those are possible, they're not really being embraced that much by serious science because they're pretty inefficient. But we do have pipelines that are taking data, <clears throat> either from like a genome sequencer or from a detector or from a uh, telescope or something and have a very high throughput, a high uh, throughput rate, and we want to process that stream and keep up with it, whether we're doing FFTs, pattern searching, other kinds of complex transformations, the data uh, applications have a, a different kind of period where there's a real-time constraint or a throughput constraint. We want to be able to do that, and then we want to support deep learning and wherever AI is going in the context of science because these machines are going to be around for, for quite a while and AI is moving very quickly right now. So we want to support all three of these things. We want to integrate across these pillars and allow people to write code that might draw on one or two or all three without having to stand on their head. I don't know how to do that exactly yet. Um, and we want to integrate the computing and whatever the acceleration strategy is and storage, uh, not make either one of those a second class citizen, um, and try to en envision what would a common software stack look like. So if we look at it from an application standpoint, right, these are just examples. Some of them are more notional, but you know, in simulation, what you normally would expect, materials, cosmology, you know, molecules, reactors, flames, quantum computers. And here I'm talking about simulating a quantum computer, right? Not a quantum computer itself. Uh, power grids, things, brain simulation, so on. Big data, the top ones are really all these, these uh, analysis pipelines, but we've also got things where you're, you might generate and test, where you're, the data might be something that's generated partially by the computer. And then on the right, deep learning applied to many different areas. And these are kind of how we're thinking about it. And then if you look at what each of these things needs, they need something that's slightly different. So the left hand most column is traditional kind of 64-bit floating point, a lot of memory bandwidth, um, maybe able to leverage some structured access to memory, but increasingly needs more uh, random access to memory uh, as sparsity becomes more important. Um, I.O. tends to be more synchronous. We're checkpointing a lot. Um, the I.O. pattern, I won't go through all of them, but the I.O. pattern here is, is typical in the sense that you tend to uh, output a lot more data than you read. Uh, and this, sometimes statistics are pretty scary that, you know, for every byte, every hundred bytes that you output, you might read one byte or maybe you never read it at all. So this is this kind of, uh, you know, we save the output in case we ever need it and we never need it. Um, and the output here is data, right? For data, uh, you need both 64-bit uh, and integer. Sometimes you can go less. You need to have embedded databases somehow in the environment. We don't really know how to do this in a, a good way yet. Um, both traditional uh, SQL databases and NoSQL, you probably do want to support some kind of MapReduce Spark thing. Often we see ourselves having to do millions of jobs. These jobs are relatively small, they kind of flood the machine, but you have to manage that. Um, and you're bringing large amounts of data in and you're pushing large amounts of data out. There's not like an asymmetric situation. And here, um, the output is usually red because the most common situation here is you're in a pipeline and so some stage of that pipeline is reading and writing it out so that some other stage can, can read it. And so both are important, uh, but the final product is data. And on the right-hand side, um, what we're finding is things that are quite different. Often, uh, we rarely need 64-bit. We can usually get by with 32. Sometimes we can get by with 16-bit floating point, um, sometimes even integer. Um, so uh, the, the design points tend to be accelerators for low precision. 
Now, it, it turns out that's not so bad because often if you need a, a big fancy engine on the left-hand side to do, say, multi multiplication for 64-bit floating point, you can build maybe four 32-bit engines out of that, maybe 16 16-bit 16 engines out of that, so these kind of work together pretty nicely. Um, right now, most applications need dense arithmetic on the right, even though on the left we tend to move more towards sparse. If we're doing inferencing, that can also be translated into eight bits. And uh, the initial Google tensor processing unit, for example, that you're actually using when you talk to Google right now is an eight bit platform. It was trained uh, typically at 32 bits and they map it to eight bits for inferencing. Um, you can do scaling. Uh, the deep learning is really dominated by two very different tasks. Training is very <laughs> um, input intensive. You're reading data over and over again. Uh, and it's, it's dominated by relative, you know, modest size matrix multiplies. Inferencing is uh, typically uh, very light on data or maybe is put into a stream and has very, uh, typically much narrower uh, matrices. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about the right-hand column is the output of training is basically a program or a model, not data. Okay, so the way that you um, archive things coming out of the right-hand side is into a database of models that you then pull out and use for something else. So this means that if we're trying to unify across these stacks, right, we've got some pretty heavy-duty uh, computer science challenges or software integration challenges. We'd like to have a unified stack that allow, supports resource allocation across these different types in a way that you can mix and match it as a first class capability inside your application. If you want to do mix some simulation with some data processing, with some machine learning, that should all be possible without having to run in completely separate software stacks. It also means we need the libraries that support these different use cases to be interoperable, right? So I shouldn't have to break my uh, uh, Petsy type of library if I'm trying to use a deep learning framework and vice versa, right? We also want to minimize data movement. And this has led to some innovative ideas in how we organize the data system. So, you know, if I'm going to couple these different modalities I was talking about, I don't want to do that via uh, data on a disk farm that's at some, uh, you know, arm's length across the machine. What I'd like to do is couple these things through data structures in memory, ideally, or maybe through some kind of non-volatile memory that's very close to the nodes. And so this idea of trying to keep data in the machine, avoiding traditional I.O. is a unifying principle, right? Of course, at the same time, um, almost everything that we run today only knows how to generate files. It doesn't know how to generate, say, key value indexed objects that we can keep in memory. So, we have to both support <coughs> traditional file I.O. while we move towards this kind of permanent or persistent in-resident, in in-memory resident data structures. And um, we need to be able to support um, running many different kinds of jobs, often at the same time, uh, and combining workflows. And this is still not the typical model for running these large-scale machines. Uh, and one thing to take away from this is, you know, there are some similarities. I mean. If you want to train a state-of-the-art network on, on the ImageNet database, um, depending if you're not using any kind of really fancy technique, that thing could run for several weeks, okay? And if you're doing hyperparameter searches where you're trying to optimize the network, you might be running <coughs> hundreds of different configurations. Well, that starts to sound a lot like an ensemble simulation or even running a single simulation with large footprint for many days or weeks. And so, this ability to support persistence is, is actually common between simulation and uh, learning. We're experimenting. This is a, a, a notional stack concept that we've been discussing with some friends at Intel that tries to uh, bridge between these three pillars. It's, it's not very well developed currently, but um, this idea that there's some kind of a multi-domain resource manager that the runtimes can talk to that can manage resources needed for each of the stacks and for development purposes that this can be um, retargeted not just for traditional HPC platforms like we're built, you know, the stuff we're building, but also you can uh, run it on things like, you know, web services and clouds and so forth. So <clears throat> I'm gonna finish up by saying this is what we're trying to build. 
This is the kind of the highest level linkage. Um, and uh, I welcome some, some questions. Uh, it's still early days. Um, uh, and thank everybody, uh, everybody who gives us money and you know, makes us give talks and everything. And uh, there you go. So I know you, I, apparently you all have to code tonight, is that? If you have a question, we need to uh, have you say your question on a mic because all this is recorded for posterity. So 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we can come back and say, ha, 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 they were so stupid. Hi, Rick. It's Cleve Moeller. Hi, Cleve. I'm, uh, I'm up there tomorrow night. Excellent. Uh, I've warmed them up for you. <laughs> Uh, a colleague of mine just went to a conference on big data in Texas where Dell Computer, which of course is homed in Texas, was handing out t-shirts. They said, in Texas, we just call it data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have to use that one. I'm going down there in a couple of months to talk to the oil and gas conference on, on big data, so I'll have to... Yeah, they merged with EMC now, right? So. So the HPE is working on the machine project, which is trying to sort of address this issue of persistent storage and whatnot. Do you have any thoughts about whether you think they were headed in the right direction, or do you think that they're missing some piece of the puzzle? I don't think they're missing anything. I mean, the you know the machine project started out, I think, as a as a concept that allowed them to tie together many different disparate technologies that HP was doing research on, like optics and memristors and Gen Z networking and so on. So, um, but we don't yet have an example. But one thing that is, I mean, to really evaluate it, but it is cons broadly consistent with what we're talking about. And, um, you know, this idea of resource disaggregation that is where you, you know, there's an extreme version of this, which, I, which I'm not talking about because I, I still have the concept of a node in here, right? But you could imagine this notion that if we had a really, f a really fantastic fabric, okay, communication fabric, that was so fast and, uh, and so cheap and, and power efficient that we could just drop memories on it, processors of different types, you could put neuromorphic things in accelerators and regular processors, and we could put non-volatile memories. We could just do all this kind of in you know, just kind of hanging off the fabric. And the precise architecture that somebody would see as a programmer or as a developer would be defined by software. This notion of kind of like a software-defined machine. And I think that's kind of where HP is thinking, right? We don't, and this is not a new concept. We had this concept, I'm trying to look at Paul, but yeah, at least 15 years, maybe 20 years ago, right? Um, and use it as a challenge to the network designers to build us a network that could scale, very low latency, very effective routing, smooth you know, properties and so on. So I still think that idea is alive. And I think you know, if HP can make some stab at it, I think it's great. Uh, we want to encourage them. Other questions? I have a quick question about uh, the, the IO bound uh, storage and uh, its connection to deep learning. Uh, we do a lot of work with image analytics based off of satellite imagery, mm -hmm. and we've done it both with uh, traditional scientific formats like HDF5, NetCDF, along with the, the trendy kind of NoSQL Hadoop-based environments. And uh, we haven't really had a lot of luck with either. Um, it comes with either flexibility or discoverability. You can either have really sophisticated uh, data structures, yeah, but then yeah. you can't find them. Yeah, exactly. Or you have... It's like performance, flexibility, or whatever, and choose one or choose two, right? Yeah. yeah exactly, yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't know if you had any insights about what you think... Well, we're doing all the same thing, that. and I, I don't think... Uh, I don't have any magic bullet there. Um, even in deep learning, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was discovered fairly, fairly uh, recently, uh, not discovered, but kind of noticed, that uh, if you have a very large uh, data sets um, and you can, and you're doing, say, shuffling on them, converting the HDF gives you some one time advantage, you know, for that kind of stuff. But I don't think we have the right model. And we're still, you know, we're still thinking in terms of these things are, I, you know, these are storage devices on the end of an IO channel. And maybe that's the wrong way to think about it, right? If we, if we think about very large persistent memories with, 
memory bandwidth-like bandwidths, and we can start loosening up about how we organize that, I, I think we would be able to make some progress. But I don't have a you know magic bullet for you, unfortunately. Thank you. Well, there's David. Wow, there's all kinds of folks I know in the back room there. Any additional question? We will have machine learning on Saturday. Prashana is coming. Uh, we have Marius Stan also in some, oh, okay. some hands-on. Yep, yep. yeah, it's the, the first time this year. OK, great. No questions? You're all ready? Oh, there's one. Oh. Uh, this is a bit more of a philosophical question, but you mentioned uh, discussing about deep learning and machine learning applications to things like subgrid modeling and, and climate uh, yeah. flows. Do you ever worry about an over-reliance on machine learning and deep learning when it comes to physical problems? I mean, uh, glossing over the actual science behind oh, it? Oh, yeah. I, I should be careful here. We're not proposing to use deep learning because we don't care about mechanistic models or physical understanding. We're just talking, I mean, at least most applications, we're not making that claim, right? If we have a good physical model, we want to use it. And we, we're using, in that example, I was using it simply as saying, um, you now have more trade-offs you can bring to the table, right? On the, on the other hand, in a bunch of the work that I'm doing in cancer, we don't have mechanistic models. And so we're trying to use um, machine learning to learn complex you know, features of the data and complex relationships that we ultimately hope to put into some kind of a framework that I would call causal inference. That is not just making some inference and we can't explain why we're making that prediction. Of course, there's a whole other talk I could give about trying to make deep learning explainable. But ultimately, we want both the predictive power that we get from the data and we want real understanding that comes from mechanistic models. And the challenge is how to use them to, to leverage each other, right? So if I've got terabytes of data but I, in biology, I want to use that to form hypotheses and then challenge my wet lab colleagues to go off and do experiments that are going to sort out among alternative hypotheses so that we can build up stronger mechanistic models. But we're not going to wait. That is, you know, we know the medical community, in fact, doesn't care, right? If you come to a, a doctor's office and you say, I have this model and it's 94% accurate, typically, but we don't really understand how it works. They say, welcome to the club, right? We don't understand how a lot of stuff works. We don't understand how a lot of the drugs work. It doesn't prevent us from using it. So I think um, we want to hit everything as fast as we can. You know, we're not, none of us are getting any younger. And these problems are hard. <clears throat> and accidentally, we've built computers that are really good at deep learning. So we might as well you know, ride the wave while we can. David must have a question. I want to have a chat with David. I, I'm uh, going to get this again tomorrow at 4.30. I'm extremely gratified I heard your talk because, um, you know, the BDEC meeting that we had recently in China, uh, I got the assignment of writing up Chapter 5. Right. And that, that trio of, you know, HPC and data and machine learning and the different ways they contribute to each other in that little 3 by 3 matrix will be part of my talk. And you've just illustrated it beautifully. So thank you. You're welcome. OK. Anything else? Last Thank time to talk with Rick. You will have this opportunity very frequently, so. OK. Thanks for being a great audience. Good luck <laughs> in your so programming. Much.